Joe, this is fantastic. I've been watching, Christine and I have been watching and you've done an amazing job. This is really spectacular. Well, Congratulations. Thank, Congratulations. Thank you, Enrique. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, and, you know, right back at you and Paul, this is, this is, you know, all the events today have been great, but this is such a good way to, to end today off, bringing the two of you together um, and, and the work that the two of you have done around the world, protecting our oceans is second to none. It's, I would say it's just getting started and, and the things that you guys are going to do over the next uh, decade are going to be phenomenal. Just getting started. I'm exhausted after 12 <laughs> years of this. <laughs> but I hear you. I, I hear what you're saying. It's a, it's a lot of work and it's busy, but I think, you know, knowing Paul the way that I do, knowing you, that it's, it's something that uh, it's a good kind of exhaustion, I think, when you can look yeah, back right. at what you've done and... Yeah. It's, it's been good practice for the big challenge coming up, Joe. <laughs> All right. So I want to do quick intros because some of the people tuning in may not be as familiar with the two of you. So we have Dr. Enrique Sala joining us, National Geographic Explorer in Residence, uh, who's dedicated to restoring the health and productivity of our oceans. So he's working around the world to do that, founding and leading the National Geographic's Pristine Seas, a project combining exploration, research, and media to inspire country leaders to protect the last wild places on the ocean. And then we have Paul Rose joining us. Paul is at the front line of exploration and one of the world's most experienced science expedition leaders. He helps scientists unlock and communicate global mysteries in the most remote and challenging regions of the planet. A former vice president of the Royal Geographic Society and the expedition leader for uh, the National Geographic Pristine Seas Expeditions. And uh, over the, the years they've helped create 13 of the largest marine reserves. 22, 22. So I'm using way, oh, I'm just saying 13 of the largest, but yeah, 20, 22 in total, but some of the largest marine reserves on the planet. And what are we over now? 6 million square kilometers? Yeah. About that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Uh, I just wanna have a chance to talk to the two of you to let you two play off each other a little bit. And Enrique, I think the best place to start is the catalyst for Pristine Seas. You know, thank you for having us, Joe. Um, I've been watching with uh, my partner in crime, Christine Regberger, the whole thing. And it's been an amazing two days, really. You have done a fantastic job, terrific job. And I know that you have organized this in a short period of time. So thank you and bravo to you. So it all started because I was a professor at the University of California at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I was studying the impacts of humans in the ocean, impacts of fishing, climate change. And one day, and, and writing all these scientific papers describing what the problems were. And one day I realized that all I was doing was writing the obituary of the ocean. And then one day I, this is a, this is a true story. I get my National Traffic Magazine. I go to my office, I had this daily ritual, monthly ritual, I close the door. I sit back, put the feet on my desk, which was overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And the magazine then came on a brown paper envelope. So I opened it up and, you know, I gave always myself one hour to enjoy it, you know, to going back to work. So I opened it and there was this double page, black and white photo of this skinny guy wearing shorts, walking with a stick on a, on a swamp, followed by three Africans overloaded with gear and, and looking exhausted. And it said mega transect. That was Mike Fay, our fellow explorer, who walked from Congo to the beaches of Gabon for a year and a half, walking 2,000 miles uh, across the wildest, uninhabited, untouched, pristine tracts of forest in West Africa. And he convinced the president of Gabon, after his walk, to protect 11 of these places, 11 national parks, 13, 13 national parks. And I said, wow, what am I doing here in, in academia? This is what I want to do in the ocean. So that was the origin of pristine seas. There we go. I've got a great scissor reel I'm gonna share in a moment, but Paul, I want to bring you in for a second. How did you become involved with pristine seas? Uh, I was, um, I'd be running some events for National Geographic in London. Um, every once in a while, they were doing something called the Great Energy Challenge and things like this. and. Um, they were putting together these events and I was happy to do them. And all, at the same time as I was doing those, just on a short-term basis, I would do, run, a big, uh, run a big event from the stage or something like that as the, as the host. Um, I was asked if I would 
host the um, British government's call to action to protect the Pitcairn Islands. And at that time, I knew about pristine seas, but not very much. And the expedition had been led uh, by Enrique and the team. And it was a, a classic sort of call to action, get all of the uh, influential people from the UK government and science groups into the Royal Society in London. And would I host that evening? And it was a good evening. We had, you know, live Skype to Pitcairn and, and all these kinds of events. And everybody was, was a bit stressed out. It was one of those events. Everyone was sort of feeling the pressure. And I was happy, and you know, I've done lots of those events. And, and I instantly linked with Enric, a man who I'd never met. And I thought he would be under extreme pressure. It's his, it's his baby who's he's led, led these expeditions and he was the, the big call to action. But Enric was as cool as a cucumber. I was very happy and we were surrounded by what seemed like a lot of very stressed out individuals. So the, the evening went brilliantly. Uh, we shared breakfast again in the morning and um, sort of had a feeling that we would work together in the future. A few weeks later, I was working for the Irish government running something called a gathering. Um, the Irish uh, in their culture have a gathering every once in a while and they contacted me and said, could I do something a bit special? I said, yeah, I'll do one underwater. And of course it was, a, it was a big success, but equally, of course, it was one hellishly chaotic period of days. And in the thick of those chaotic days in sideways wind on the Welsh, on the Irish coast, and I could barely hear anything, um, Henry called and I recognized his number. I took the call, obviously, trying to keep it dry and uh, everything. I could barely understand what he was saying, but I said, yes, <laughs> and here I am. You know, I think uh, this seems like a familiar pattern with you, Paul. I, uh, you know, I, I couldn't have pulled this together in such a short period of time without you running alongside me. And I called you the morning after I thought of this. Uh, and I don't even think I'd finished. And you were like, yes, let's do it. So that, that's amazing, Paul. Uh, what I want to do now is share this sizzle reel. I want people to dive into some of these pristine places and see just what Pristine Seas is all about. So bear with me for a moment while I do a quick screen share here. And cue this up. There it is. We are defined by the environments that we live in. When they say, where do you come? The first thing that comes to my mind is the reef, the forest, the corals. Maybe that's who I am. The moment I set my eyes on these remote islands, I know why we're here. This place is melting like a popsicle in Arizona in the summertime. The big fish are gone. They have been fished out. And it only takes a few fishing boats and they can remove hundreds of years of biomass in just a very short period of time. After 10 years as a professor, I realized that I was just writing the obituary of the ocean. I quit academia and assembled a team to do something about it. I want to show to the world what the ocean was like hundreds of years ago and why we have to preserve them. these rare places on Earth, a time machine, where we can see the ocean of the past. What we do is hunt out the last pristine places in the ocean and protect them. The ocean has amazing regenerative power. We just need to let it heal itself. In one single pulse, in one immeasurably powerful heartbeat, the ocean has just changed my life.
I mean, you're you a know, good man, Joe. You know, I, th I think Henrik probably feels the same. When we each get to the end of that um, short film, normally it's us taking to the podium or the stage and um, saying something to a large audience. We haven't quite got used to the fact that we just stay where we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I have been diving for about 15 years now. It's one of my favorite things to do uh, of life. And you guys travel to these pristine places. Enrique, what is it like when you take that first step off of the back of the boat and drop into one of these pristine places? It is like the first time because every place we go to is different, right? And we know it's going to be amazing because we tend to go to places that are remote and most of them are uninhabited and, and not really fished. So that we always have this excitement of, you know, how is it, what is it going to be? And many of the places we go to, nobody has been doing any research or filming there. You know, the Lion Islands, for example, the Southern Lion Islands, when we went on our first pristine sea expedition in 2009, there were no studies about the underwater world or, or a single photograph or film. So it was like, wow, is it going to be like we think? And you jump in the water and as soon as the bubbles clear, you are surrounded by sharks. So, oh yeah, <laughs> this is it. Or when we went diving uh, on the kelp forest of, of Cape Horn in Southern Chile, there was no diving guide to the fjords of uh, Patagonia or, uh, yeah, that nobody, very few people dive there. So we had to just based on our intuition over that we have uh, developed over the years, dive in the places that we thought because of the topography and, and the currents that we thought would be uh, more interesting. Uh, so yeah, every time it's pure, it's like being a half detective, half little kid, where you are super excited about what you're going to find, you know, and you don't know exactly, but yeah, it's, it's, it's always, the, but every time, every, every first step in, in, in the water in those places is like the first time. Amazing. So Paul, there's a lot that goes on before that first step. Can you tell us a little bit about preparation for an expedition? Yeah, preparation is, is, is a great time because it's a, it's a wonderful challenge. Because then when I deal with scientists all of my life, I often meet scientists with a, with a, with, with a plan that, that, that is, a, you know, almost incomprehensible. It's, it's a beautiful thing scientifically and equations and it might even just be on the back of an envelope. It could be anything. Um, and I love to meet scientists with a plan like that and convert that thing, that hypothesis, or this crazy idea and turn it into remote camps and icebreakers and divers and climbers and all the other support activities. Um, the great thing about our team, Pristine Seas team, is we, we really are a brilliant team, you know, really high performing team, but relaxed at the same time. And because Henrik is practical, it means that we don't go down some crazy sort of caveats with the planning. You know, Henrik has a plan, it's crystal clear. Um, and one of the earliest experiences I had with Enric was, um, as we planned the expeditions, I wondered how much information Enric would give me. But he instantly knew me very well and uh, didn't give me very much. <laughs> and let me, let me plan it. And it's a lovely feeling to, to go from, here's the science ideas, here's where we're going, and then allowed me to sort of own it and put my personality within there. I mean, Enric came up with this idea of this project. This is his project. So there's a very lovely, subtle relationship between the ownership that Enric must feel and the ownership I need to feel to make the expedition run. So during those days of the planning, there's the early stage. And as we build it, it's just pulling in the expertise of all of the people and using this. We, Enric and I use the same technique. They don't, the team don't need leading by the hand. They know exactly their part of the equation and the process and they do their thing it just needs a bit of guiding once in a while perhaps that we've got a very big ship perhaps we've got a small one and we have to have a reduced team or perhaps there's uh, you know other changes with partners and things that are a little bit out of our control but in general that planning is exciting and it builds up you know from the sort of rough plan we we know where we're going in one year and the second year we know a you know, a little bit more detail and the third year becomes a bit more variable. So as we get closer to that date, it becomes tighter and tighter and tighter. And I love that sort of delivering it to a deadline. It's a really great moment. So there's the whole science structure, there's the whole political opportunity and analysis and 
relationship with partners running along. Um, and then there's the bit that, that I really thrive at, and that is actually the practicality of, of how do we run this thing. And I love that challenge, always have done. So we're, we're a great team, you know, we're, we really are a good bunch. You know why I brought Paul into the project? Because he's much better than me. You know, he's the best expedition leader I know. He's unbelievable. You know, we, I actually tested him because after meeting each other at, at that event at the Royal Society, the, the uh, summer after we were going on one of the most challenging expeditions we've done so far, which was in Franz Josef Land, the most northern, the northernmost archipelago on the planet, north of Russia, between Russia and the North Pole. And I invited Paul to come. Right? without instructions or you know any any specific goal and you know we learned very quickly that we, well we had a team of 20 uh, from on our side scientists and filmmakers and explorers and a 20 on the russian side and the russian scientists were all uh, wonderful and and great experts uh, but there was a little um the atmosphere the modus operandi was a little chaotic and we had to add, we had to to that we had to add the the lost in translation aspect, right? And the cultural differences. At one point, you know, it took very little, a very short time for me to realize that wow, you know, I cannot handle this and 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 do the science and and this is just crazy. I said, Paul, you know, um, why don't you take care of it? And that was it. He brought, he took his, um, he produced his whiteboard with a sharpies and starting uh, um, organizing every everybody. And after two days. It was like smooth sailing for for the rest of the expedition. So um, that was the the proof, practical proof that Paul was going to do a much better job than me as expedition leader. Uh, so yeah, it's been uh, it's been so much fun and much easier for me since. <laughs> I've heard of tough tests for a gig, but I think that is that is one of the toughest tests, the uh, initiations, if you will. Uh, Always up for a challenge, Joe. Oh, absolutely, Paul. No question. Uh, before we move away a little bit from the planning side of things, uh, another question for you, Paul. How hard is it to procure a submersible? What is that? How hard is it to get your hands on a submersible for one of these expeditions? Uh, it's tricky. We, we, um, we're we lucky because um, we have a great relationship with Undersea Hunter, who are based in uh, Punta Rinas, Costa Rica. And they have a beautiful ship called the Argo, which is one of the smallest vessels we use, but it's been it's a bespoke diving vessel. So everywhere you put your hand or go to put things, it just works and fits perfectly for a dive team such as us. I mean, they even have a, a special uh, containerized media lab for all the underwater film gear and everything else. Um, but they also have this amazing submarine called Deep Sea. And that's what we use um, invariably for our submarine work, down to 400 meters. So we like to operate down to about 350 meters. Changes our lives, you know, for the scientists to go into that depth, have a long, relaxed dive, for non-scientists to go in and contribute to the science that way, and in particular for uh, decision makers, country leaders, and influencers of all kinds to uh, go down in submarine, fall in love with their own waters, maybe for the first time, and then they can have the uh, uh, excitement and energy to help protect it. So really the Argo is just an amazing uh, ship for us. Yeah, so we touched on that yesterday, uh, Enrique. We talked. You talked about, um, you know, bringing back media and such to the policymakers and seeing the look on their face when they see what's what's in their waters and 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 what's at stake. Um, and that submersible sounds like an incredible tool to bring them right fresh in there. Can you guys tell me about um, the first expedition that the two of you were on together, where you had that big success afterwards, where a new marine protected area was was pledged, was, was born. Prince Joseph and I guess, and Rick together, um, because this it was, it was a good, big eye opener for me, Joe. Um, as I say, you know, quite rightly, Enric had said, you know, th th this sounds great. Why don't you join us in Russia? And I said, yes, um, as you know, how I tend to do that, Joe. And, um, and off I went. Um, and, and then quite a little bit later, I had to play catch up during those weeks as to all the, the background and the political situation. And it looked to me, really, really ambitious. Uh, you know, the Russian Arctic, uh, all the complications with um, uh, the history of the Russian Arctic, Arctic the military aspects, the, all of the sense of uh, geopolitical claims going on up there, um, let alone all of the difficulties that can happen in, 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 in Russian policies and politics. And I didn't understand any of it. 
uh, I was super happy to understand that Edric knew about it. Um, and even better, had a way through this. So Edric has a way, Edric has a way of backing good horses by doing the right analysis. So we sort of know we're on for success where we go. We tend not to do the classic conservation model where you go somewhere, everybody falls in love with it, and then you realize you're gonna spend your life trying to protect it. Um, Enric and the, and the team, we all do all the policy analysis first. So all that had been done, even though it did feel incredibly ambitious to me, but it was a beautiful expedition, amazing place to be. There was a sense that we were gonna make it happen even though it was tricky, the Russians were delightful. There was a big sense of cooperation afterwards. There were, even the way we do science papers, um, Enric and Alan Friedlander, who's our chief scientist, you know, pop out those incredible science papers, 112 of them in the last number of years, very quickly, very accurately. Whereas a few years ago, say in Britain, we would spend many years getting science papers out. That's the way we discovered some of the Russian um, institutions we used to work in. And so they were wanting to produce their, their work slowly, carefully, and keep it going, whereas we have an appetite for getting it out quick. So it was very complicated to pull all that together. Emrick and the team did it. Um, and then there was a sense that when we got back to Murmansk, I remember thinking, well, there is hope. So I'd gone from this sense of like, wow, this looks impossible, having this amazing experience, to then realizing there is hope and it was going to happen. And sure enough, when it got signed in and, and agreed as the Russia, you know, new Arctic marine protected area, it, it was an unbelievable presence. But I remember being completely overwhelmed with emotion that I was part of that. And very recently, you know, just before the COVID-19 crisis, I was lucky enough to be the pristine seas representative in Oslo at the Oslo Philharmonic, because one of the outputs of our expedition, as well as the, the science papers, the media, and indeed um, helping to influence and be partners with the government to make it happen was a symphony, the Arctica Symphony. And I found myself again, you know, standing at the back of the uh, Oslo concert hall, floods of tears, while the orchestra played all their classic instruments and this whole array of special instruments, big chunks of ice, things with dripping water, hammers and spoons and shovels to, to create the Arctic sound. So yeah, it was, for me, it was, I went from, well, this looks fantastic. Holy smokes, I don't think we stand a chance. Oh, there is hope to suddenly emotionally experience and we did it. It all, it all comes down to, well, you need to have a good team, right? And, and we are lucky that Paul and I are part of a great team of scientists, filmmakers, experts in communications and operations policy. But it, it all comes down to personal relationships we needed to have the good personal relationships with the key Russian scientists in order to first get a permit, right? We needed to collaborate with the uh, um, Russian Academy of Sciences and the Arctic, Russian Arctic National Park staff. And also we needed good relationships with the Russian Geographical Society, which we have a, a fantastic uh, relationship and an agreement for uh, exploration and education and uh, raising awareness about the beauty of the Arctic. So, you know, you cannot do this. You can have the best team of the world, but you cannot parachute in a place and pretend that you're going to make things happen, right? So you have to work with, with the locals. And there are no locals up there because it's such a remote archipelago. It's never been inhabit, uh, inhabited in, in the past, in history, right? So there were no local communities we had to deal with, but we had to deal with the proper agencies and the proper um, academic institutions. So this is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about when we scout a new place to, to go to. And who are the key players? Who are the people who have the uh, greatest knowledge about this place? Who are the people who have the greatest, who are the trusted messengers also that will be able to communicate the conclusions from our scientific expeditions and translate it to, to the key uh, political audiences in the country? Uh, Enrique, what was it like for you? You know, obviously you have that biology background, but to take that next step to start navigating that political world, which must have been like fish out of water, yeah. you know, to do that for the first time. Yeah, well, I had no idea because in academia, they, they teach you how to write scientific papers in a, in a language that a uh, few other people understand and sure. in, in a way as complicated as possible, right? With long introductions and caveat and methods, et cetera. And only at the end, you get to the conclusion. So I was very lucky in my 
uh, later years in academia, I was part of a program called the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program. And that was a program for uh, medium, mid-career scientists to learn how to speak in plain English. I'm still not there. I'm still speaking in plain Spanglish. But uh, they told us how to, they trained us for two weeks, how to speak to media, radio, TV, uh, live interviews, papers, how to write an op-ed, also how to communicate to policymakers. So we spent a week, a group of us, I think it was about 30 people. And we were trained by some of the best uh, journalists in the United States, like uh, Juliet Elperin from the Washington Post, or um, Ken Weiss of the LA Times, Nancy Barron, a fantastic group. So we, went, we spent a week in Washington, D.C., and we did mock congressional testimonies and things like that. Uh, it, was, it was a steep learning curve. You know, we, we all had to learn so many things to make this project uh, work. And yeah, the beauty is that we've been able to combine the things that National Geographic is, is known for, exploration, research, and media. And then we have brought all the, all the policy aspects, all the persuasion aspects to make people fall in love with these places and, and help to protect them. All right. I want to go behind the scenes a little bit. We've talked a lot about team. Obviously, you've worked together with each other uh, a lot and, and, and your team. Obviously, you bring in local um, scientists and such on the expeditions. So let's go behind the scenes. You've had an exhausting day. It's been busy. Are there shenanigans that go on? Do you play pranks on each other? Like what goes on on these expeditions? <laughs> well, yeah, the, 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 the greatest thing is you've got to keep up some kind of individual spirit. And, um, you know, some people want to get back from the you know, end of a long day and you know, jump in the sea and just, you know, swim around without diving gear on, without doing science, just jump in the water and have a swim. Some people want to lay in the sun and fall asleep. Some people go to the bunk and, and, and go to sleep. Everybody needs their own space. There's a thing about space that we all, that we all enjoy. But then typically, um, you know, food is the great mo motivator, like bait. You know, we put the bait out, so food comes. And um, that's always a good thing. So at food time, dinner time, there's a chance to get together, get the planning going, as Enric says, get the famous whiteboard out. And we're, um, we're in business, you know, and then, then we can. So at that time, it can be really wonderful for either, you know, someone to tell some stories, someone to maybe reflect on the day, uh, someone to, it's all, I always enjoy the ones where, you know, people are showing images or films or stories about their homes. I really like that, you know, maybe missing home a bit and here are some stories that's fun like that. We don't have too many pranks and jokes because, you know, we're a long way from anywhere. And so we don't want any pranks and jokes going a bit too far wrong. You know, if they, if they are, they tend to be very, very mild. I can't think of anything crazy, you know, or anything, because the last thing we want to do is accidentally have a, have a small prank turn into something that breaks some equipment or uh, damages somebody. But there's a, it's, it's good fun, that's for sure. There is a good sense on, when we have guests on board, and when we do have guests on board, they tend to be, um, you know, country leaders, very influential individuals, uh, donors, sponsors of all kinds, and uh, uh, in-country scientists. So we tend not to have sort of inside jokes that, that would make them feel excluded. But what we always hear is they've had a great time. It doesn't matter who it is. We can have, you know, multimillionaire on board. We can have country leaders. We can have scientists of all kinds who are used to a, a very academic approach or whatever it might be. And we always hear that they've had an absolutely great time. And I feel that way too. We might be completely exhausted at the end of the trip. We might be completely exhausted at the end of every day if it's one of those trips. But there is some, we do have a secret source to have fun and uh, do this important work. Yeah. Uh, Enrique, after each victory, do you, is there, do you have a little ritual, a little ceremony? Do you put your feet up and have a drink like, or are you already thinking of the next, uh, the next quest? Yeah, the problem is that we will never be done with work, right? It's not that we, uh, at five o'clock we go home and we forget about work because the pressure on the world's biodiversity is relentless and increasing. So there's no moment for, you know, not much time for relaxation, but we do uh, like to take a moment and celebrate each one of them. Our team is mostly remote. We have a small number of people here in DC, but Paul is in uh, between Geneva and, and England. 
and we have people in Russia, Chile, Hawaii, Wales, Spain, Switzerland, and we have a, yeah, and we're going to have people from other parts of the world also joining the, the team soon. So, you know, we cannot get together, but what we do is um, the team here in Washington, D.C., we all, I always take it out, take them out um, to dinner and we celebrate properly. And, uh, but right now, I think we are talking to each other more than before because we have uh, a weekly pristine seat happy hour. <laughs> Very cool.